Aloha kako. Um, welcome to tonight's show of Kanakanology. We're glad to be back and continuing our series with Mana Vahine. Um, tonight, we're so, so happy and stoked to have my hoa Aina. Aina um, Ioane is with us tonight, and thank you for joining us. Aina is of Hilo. She um, is the daughter of Uncle Skippy, one of our favorite Aloha Aina warriors, and um, has been doing all kinds of stuff throughout her life. And um, especially lately, I have noticed, has been working on a homeschool curriculum working um, with Aina-based kind of curriculum. <laughs> and so I'd like to hear more about that and about your mo'olelo. you like to share with us tonight, you know, what it was like growing up in Kyokaha and um, how your journey got you to this place. Kiki no. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. Thank you, Auntie, for asking me to be here. Um, <laughs> you know, it's been a um, it's been a long weekend, uh, and it was a good weekend of reflection. Uh, we just uh, celebrated the what is this? The new journey of my grandma, my grandmother Nancy, my mother's uh, mom. We laid her to rest next to Grandpa this weekend, so it was a mm. it was a good Ohana gathering. Um, Ohana came from Oahu. Uh, cousins came from the mainland that I haven't seen in over you know 15 years and so it was a it was a good time to to sit and reflect with, with family <clears throat> and um, you know when I was talking doing my grandmother's services one of the enlightening moments that happened was talking about uh, when, when we when we planted her next to grandpa it was the Hilo moon actually rose right after the sun and so the kind of memory that I gave at that time was talking to my Ohana about new beginnings and that it was such a timely thing because, you know, we, we ascended Grandma Nancy up into the stars. And so I, I was talking to my family about imagining a bridge, you know, it's a Hilo moon. So we get to bridge that, that entire world that we knew with grandma in it. And now we have to create this uapo or this bridge for our entire new world without Grandma Nancy in it. <clears throat> mm. And so we all sat around after and talked about um, where we are in life. You know, we haven't seen each other in 15 years. And, and, and what are we doing now? And so I was talking to my cousin from the mainland and I was explaining to her that, you know, we're back at home <clears throat> after almost 15 years too. We're back at home in the Aina in King's Landing. Um, and I got to talk sorry, with my dad a little bit about why, why we went into King, King's Landing in the first place. And so my father told me that when Oni had Lihao, who's the oldest, mm -hmm. and I believe she was born in 1980, um, Papa went with the guidance of his grandfather, uh, William Kanaka Ole Iwane. Now, my grandfather, uh, until about, I think, a year or two ago, his original house stood in the homestead of Kyokaha, the yellow house on Todd Ave. Wow. Um, and he, yeah, those hale, his hale uh, yeah. was the, one of the first hales in the homestead of Kyokaha. And my father <clears throat> used to go to the Todd Ave house in the summers. And then when Grandpa Iwane needed more help, they sent my dad down from Oahu to go and live with Grandpa Iwane to, to help him in those uh, during that time and it was during this time and then when, when dad decided to come home with his family when he only had lihao it was grandpa Iwane who encouraged him to go into the aina because you know it was right around the time of the hawaiian renaissance and my father explained to us that so um so much hawaiian so many hawaiians wanted and felt the iini in them to to reconnect you know to reconnect to you know, all things Hawaiian. And at that time, and it's sometimes it's hard, hard for me to really grasp that mindset because from that generation of my father to where we are today, we've gained so much. And so at that time, you know, we have to imagine that they, they, there wasn't anything, you know? Mm -hmm. And when I say that there wasn't anything, it's because it was taken away, you know? We had, you know, I'm a, I'm a Hawaiian immersion alumni, right? And so my parents, you know, we were tribute to the cause, to the Hawaiian Renaissance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so even that, even that in the Kaukaha homestead, they were not ready. They were not ready mm -hmm. for Hawaiian immersion yet. And so we felt that, that, that bite, 
growing up in Hawaiian immersion, just like we felt that bite growing up in King's Landing. You know, it was it wasn't very popular yet. All things Hawaiian weren't popular mm -hmm. when we were growing up. And when my father wanted to go into the Aina, grandpa, he went with Grandpa Iwane and he told us this great story that um, Grandpa already needed a ko'oko ko by that time. So he would bring a chair for Grandpa and he would cut the trail to where our hale is. And so he just hand cut the trail. And when he got to a certain distance, he'd open up a certain space and then he would walk Grandpa up with the chair to the new space and they would sit down. And then they did that for a few days. And he said that grandpa just enjoyed it, you know, enjoyed mm -hmm. being in the space, in this new land. And that when they finally got to a space, grandpa Iwane told him, okay, this is where you're going to build your hale. You know, and I never got to ask, only now I wonder, oh, what was it that grandpa said this was the place for the hale? You know, was it the, he found the top of the pool? Did he find the top of the pool? Did he find a water source? I'm not sure. I never got to ask that, but... Grandpa Iwane told him that this was going to be the space. And so that is where my father started to hand clear the space that, um, you know, then built our house that raised all six of us in King's Landing. That's so and, amazing, though. He got to, like, witness that the physical reclaiming of it, though, yeah? Like, actually going and hand cutting. Yeah. Yes. It's, and that's, like, um, so, like, um, iconic of what that really was, you know? Like, to just bring the the people's back. Mean, awesome. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, my mother, brave as she is, one of the things, and, you know, every, when we were younger, I was like, oh, that is a bit crazy. But I only say that because, you know, you're conditioned to believe such a thing. But my mother gave birth to five of her six kids in the Aina. Mm -hmm. And and the story was, I don't know if it was, because Akole was the first. Akula was going to be the first, the second born was going to be the first to be born in the Aina. And uh, my mom told us that uh, Uncle Emmett Aluli was supposed to be the doctor. But at that time, he had to fly somewhere. So, but that was the original plan. He was going to be here within the <laughs> my mother's due date and he was going to give birth to uh, my sister Uncle Nea. But he was off island. And so my auntie Malia was a nurse practitioner. And so she was in there at the time. And so my mother gave birth to her second child in the darkness of the Aina with a nurse practitioner. And wow. um, yeah. And that's it, brave. Um, that's brave. That's brave. That's brave. I have three keiki. It's brave. That's brave. <laughs> yeah. That's a manavahina right there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, she, but sure, sure, you know, she knew. She knew she was safe. You know, and she, you know, being so brave, she made, I think, one of the largest sacrifices in our life to afford us the opportunity to be born in the Aina, to have that um, instantaneous connection to your space. Mm -hmm. And it's only in these older years that I understand it. You know, when I was younger, I'm like, my mother's that's a little bit crazy what she did. But mm -hmm. now that I'm older and have my own cake, and more settled in in my thinking process uh, I realized that, that that's what she gave us and you know not many uh Hawaiians get to uh feel that type of connection to their space and their I know mm -hmm. and and so I I what do I do I lean on that a lot um now in my decision making I lean on the fact that um that it's those spaces that are guiding my decision making. Uh, I, I lean on the fact that when I, I, I feel you, you feel in your na'au where you're supposed to go, uh, I lean on the fact that it, it comes from that space. It comes from being born and having that, um, you know, that, that connectivity fire at birth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so growing up in the Aina was, as a child, I have to say the best thing ever, because as a child, you, my parents protected us from the outside world. So as a child, you know, it was just us. We were in the hood, you know, it was bumpy road and we had like friends, you know, by the time dad came in, there were two other Ohanas in there. Uh, one was Kua Ohana and then one were the Pakanis. And so, but once we came in, other Ohanas came as well. And, you know, we grew up and we had a, a, like a bike, we called ourselves a gang. And then, 
You know, there was the Laimanas right next to us. We had the Pelicanes. And there was um, about four girls uh, our age. You saw get me, my twin sister, the two older sisters, and then four other girls. And we'd ride up and down. And, you know, we thought we didn't, you know, no YouTube, no internet, no, no even color TV. We had black and white TV growing up with the bunny ears outside and, and the two wow. knobs. And so we, we really were sheltered from outside world influences. And we, you know, our choices of the day after, you know, whatever kulianas you have to do around the house was whose house are we going to go swim at? Are we going to go turn right and go to Uncle Bill's pond? And my Uncle Bill, uh, I mean, my Uncle James, Iopa, had a huge pond, uh, Waikiakua. It's like a huge freshwater pond. And so, you know, we could choose to go there and he had a rope and we could swing off the rope and into the big pond. Wow. Or, you know, we could go left and go to Uncle Bill's bay. And Uncle Bill had his own bay with black sand and his own freshwater pond. And so, you know, to us, there was, there was nothing better. <laughs> <laughs> you know you just ride up and down the road and decide where you're gonna go and swim and hang out with your friends for the day so you know in those elementary years I didn't really feel feel it I didn't really feel the bite of you know stereotypes mm -hmm. because later on in about you know sixth grade and middle school you hear people say things you know once I realized what they were saying, they, you know, they called us homeless and they called us squatters. And, and you know, wow. at that time when you start in, in about seventh grade, when you start to really, you know, try and figure out, you know, you're in that awkward stage, right? Who you are, what are you going to do? It's, it's hard to hear that. Um, you know, oh, yeah, you, that's like you, socially you, crippling, crippling in middle mm -hmm. school for yeah. someone to call you like homeless, like you're stink. It's such a hard age. Mm -hmm such a hard age and so it was I think it was frightening because before that that world was you know the best to me and then to hear somebody mm -hmm. say that it wasn't the best you know it's shattering yeah mm -hmm. wow mm. right. so you know that's the sac the sacrifice again I think um, as a ohana we gave to the movement <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even while at um, Kulakai Puni Okeokaha, when we went, our kumus were great. They did the best at sheltering us too. I can't imagine what kind of things they must have heard as kumu. You know, because, you know, imagine we're in Keokaha. We have, at the time, we still had the Mormon church on the right-hand side where um, Kuipu guys are now. Mm. We still had the Mormon church, huge Mormon church. And then we have Maliapuka Okalani. Catholic Church, mm -hmm. all in the homestead. And so, you know, here we are bringing in Hawaiian back into the homestead. And, you know, our kumu was of the good fight. Mahalo to them. We had Va'oli at the steps of Keokaha Elementary, right mm -hmm. at the flagpole with the American flag and the Hawaiian flag below it. And we would do, you know, our morning protocols. And our morning mm -hmm. protocols were right on, you know, back then, old school, school, real classic. You have the, the stairs, yeah, going up to the second level. Mm -hmm. And so... We, that's where we would stand every morning and we were right in the front of the office and the office bless them they had to be <laughs> Hawaiian immersion office and English office at the same time mm -hmm. and so they weren't very happy about it you know like even up to when you got to go to the nurse it's like oh you know well, I don't know did we have different color nurse tags in the English side I don't know but somehow they knew <laughs> we were in the classroom and, and, you know, you just feel it. You're like, I don't want to go to the kid. I don't want to go to the office. No, thank you. You know what I mean? And, you mm. know, I, they, we, we serenaded them every morning with our va'oli. And, you know, it must have shocked them. You know, it, even just winning the fight in legislature for Hawaiian immersion to, you know, to be born into our communities must have mm. shocked people. And then mm -hmm. for people to hear us on a daily basis, hear Ola Hawaii surrounding them, you know, wow. we were happy within our space. But once mm -hmm. we went outside of our space, shared areas like the playground, we had shared areas with the English, right? We play at the same time. We have to eat lunch at the same time. You know, those things were, have became terrifying um, experiences. Wow. Um, there, were, there, were, there were names, you know, that they'd call us compared to the other, you know, students. It was real segregated, you know, if 
somebody wants to ask me, <laughs> yeah, I'd say it was real segregated, Hawaiian immersion in English in, in the homestead of Keokaha. And, you know, there were, they, there were choice words that they'd often use to describe us as a whole if we were being unruly in the cafeteria or, you know, real class action kind and unruly <laughs> on the fields, you know, was the Hawaiian immersions who did that. And I'm like, okay. So, and even the kids, you know, I see them today, the ones I went to school with, you know, they're at Keokaha Elementary. I was at Kulakai Puni or Keokaha, but we're on the same campus. And, you know, I see them today. And today, you know, you hop, skip and jump 25 years later and it's a whole new world, you know, of Hawaiian things and hawaiian mm -hmm. and Hawaiian pride. Mm -hmm. But it, in the sixth grade, it was not so. <laughs> in the fifth grade, it was not so. And, and then when we um, moved on to Navahi, it was a much more uh, fun and enlightening experience because we were once again on our own campus. We didn't have to share campuses, you know, everybody was of like mind and of like, you know, motivation. And so it was, it was nice to then be there. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I don't often get to reflect back on those memories, but, and I, I, I'm not upset at the kids. At that time, I was upset at them. You know, you're in sixth grade and you want to naturally, you know, disagree with the other people who are not <laughs> in your group. <laughs> but I see them today and I, and, and once again, I have to thank my parents for, you know, you know, forcing us in that sense, because I think at around fifth grade or fourth grade, I asked my mom to transfer me to English side because it was, it was hard to go to school. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to be normal. I remember telling her, I just want to be normal and I want to go to English side because everybody on the English side makes you feel like you're not normal being in Hawaiian immersion. Mm -hmm. And as a Kumu sometimes on Kaumeke campus, where we have our own campus, I try to, um, tell my students this, you know, do you know how fortunate you are? You are in a, in an environment where there's only a little Hawaii, you know, people came before you who fought the good fight and, you know, where we were feeling uncomfortable and going to school. And now you, you know, it's in a sense on a silver platter for them. And it's not their fault. They're like, no, we don't understand you, Kumu. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to reflect on. It is such a different time and we're so fortunate and you know how amazing what our children are going to be raised up with and like our mo'opuna. Yeah, mm -hmm. cause like how far it has come from those original days where it was still and very shame thing, you know, or not, maybe not shame, it, that's not appropriate maybe, but you know, it was like you said, a real it's different. different. Real different. You know, and my father, you know, my father, bless his soul. Yeah. He would <laughs> ask us, he would ask us, we would go hold signs with him in different places, you know. Uh, Mary Monarch, we used to hold signs every year outside Mary Monarch. We'd have a big 20 by 30 in the parking lot and, and camp in the parking lot and serve. We all, as a community, the King's Landing community, we'd go and right. hold signs, you know, like the kingdom is alive you know, illegal overthrow. And you have to imagine this is one of my sixth grade, this is the early nineties, you know, and we are out there and poor thing, I, I would hold the sign when I got to like seventh grade, I'd hold the sign to cover my face. You know, everybody's <laughs> passing through for my monarch and your daddy is making you, you know, stand there and you have all your uncles with their parels and all your auntie Moanis with their kues on the side. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you see your horse passing by. But now, you know, you look at the Mauna movement, you know, holding signs is a mea ma amau, you know, mm -hmm. it's it normalized it from, mm -hmm. from the days where, you know, you hide behind your, your um, you know, illegal overthrow, kue signs to, you know, holding it proudly and you can see your whole face and, you know, mm -hmm. get my selfies mm -hmm. there, but see I'm a part of the movement. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but the part of it is like the work that came of that because at the time it wasn't so widely known those facts that we just take for granted the kue petition that we just take for granted that everybody knows it was illegal you know it was so not you know and like you say it's really interesting i don't reflect on that a lot you know that you really bring it to the forefront of like how much we take for granted these facts and how widespread that knowledge is and the, the impact, like the implications no, of that being widespread. 
So like, how mm-hmm. was it in your high school experience? Like, when did you start? What was it when, like, you know, you was always raised in that kue kind of life. What when what would happen when you like really grab a hold of it for yourself? Like, at what point did it become part of your own? Not until I had my own kids. <clears throat> um, you know, and all, all these little things. So when we were younger, mom also put us into halal, and you know, I I. I don't remember the younger years, you know, I think mom enrolled us at five, but I remember <laughs> at six, in sixth grade, in sixth grade, same time, I, right around the time I um, asked her to go to English side school, I also asked her if I could stop dancing hula so I could play volleyball because all the cool kids played volleyball. And so I just wanted to be a normal kid who went to English school and played volleyball. Okay. I was in Kilkaha. Do you know what volleyball is in Kilkaha? <laughs> so those are the things that my environment were conditioning me to feel was normal. And so, you know, going into middle school, you want to blend in. It's hard when your father is skipping your one and all he wants to do is blend out of the current mainstream mindset. So I, I didn't, to answer your question, I didn't start to really embrace it until I had my own kids. Because when you have your own kids, then it forces you to think back in your life about the things you wanna make sure they also experience that you experience, you know? Mm-hmm. I get to go back and think, okay, then I thought I was embarrassed, but now I'm, I'm proud and I wanna make sure that they're proud. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't until having Keiki that mm-hmm. I um, wanted, uh, wanted to ensure their foundation mm-hmm. so so yeah I had keiki um I went to school because my mother is an educator my grandmother was an educator my late grandmother was an educator my grandfather was an educator so you know the one thing in my life I said in when I started college was I am not going to be an educator and, <laughs> and so I actually got my original degree in business because oh, wow. that was the yeah that was the mainstream thing too at the time you know I'm gonna be I'm gonna be an English speaking uh student child that plays volleyball and that (laughs) works in an office or some sort okay that was what I had thought was gonna be uh normal successful and blend in in my environment my father (laughs) did say I was blending though so so then I I did that I graduated with my BA and then I, uh, in the in-between, I went to work at Kulakai Puni of Keokaha. I was actually mm-hmm. working there before while going to school, you know, as an EA. <clears throat> EA is a good uh, place to be when you're in school because you can do the two. So I was an EA and I, I, even as an EA, I said, no, 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 I'm not going to be a cool. I'm, I'm here while I get my degree and then I will <laughs> be off out of business. Um, and then after, after graduating with my BA in business, I actually went back to Kaumeke and they needed help in the middle school. And so it was going to be the first time uh, Kaumeke only went up to sixth grade. <clears throat> and then when they, during the charter school movement, Kula Kayapuni Okeokaha, when, when the Kumus decided, and they were bold, I love my Kumus at Kula Kayapuni Okeokaha, there we go again, making the bold decisions, they went to charter. And they went to charter because they wanted to have stronger control of their curriculum and they wanted to have stronger control of, of the environment in which they teach their keiki. So, mm-hmm. and some kumu at Kulakai Puni at that time were not comfortable. And they, so they left Kaumeke for, you know, the stability of DOE. We all know the unfairness of charter. So, you know, my mother stayed on and she was one of the founders of Kaumeke Kaeo Public Charter School. Kulakai Puni Okeoka had to be renamed when they became charter. So that's how we got Kaumeke Kaeo Public oh. Charter School after it was renamed. <clears throat> oh. And so, yeah, and then when we had our first set, <clears throat> when Kaumeke became Kaumeke, they had a, a, a kindergarten class. When that kindergarten class became sixth grade, they wanted to retain them. And so they, they developed a middle school program. And it was going to be the first for Kula Kaio Puni, okay, I mean, Ka- Kaumeke at that time. Mm-hmm. So when they were going to do middle school, they were looking for Kako'o in middle school. So I, you know, I kind of I jumped on it because it was going to be something new in the community. And then lo and behold, must have been the Grandma Nancy in the world or the gene that's, you know, I always thought it was my Grandma Nancy side, the educational gene. But also uh, my great grandmother, uh, Edith Keonauna Akui, uh, Grandpa Iwan is wife she actually taught at 
uh, Kelkaha Elementary as one of the first teachers. She oh, was wow. a teacher. She was, you know, only one. She was preschool teacher, health aide, and I think she did adult school at night. <laughs> wow. Well, wow. So education came from both sides. And so the education DNA must have sprouted right around that time or it, and I think it was the group of kids that I was with at Kaumeke you know I still accredit them to me becoming a teacher it was that specific set of kids that I was working with that you know really inspired me to and they asked me Kumo you don't want to become a Kumo I'm like no 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 I think it almost took me like two years I kept on telling everybody no 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 <laughs> and, and then finally I went back to school uh, I was help I with my eldest I actually just gave birth to her when I went do my student teaching. So, and she's seven now. <clears throat> so I went back to school, got my teaching certificate uh, for middle and high school, language arts. And then I taught at Kaumeke for uh, 10 years. 10 years I taught at Kaumeke. And when I had my daughter, Vahine, I was adamant. And, you know, my husband, he bless his soul. <laughs> he doesn't <laughs> argue with me when it... <laughs> When it comes to uh, education, you know, I said, they're going Kula Kai Puni and, and they're going to Kaumeke, you know, <laughs> and he's like, okay. Uh, and I had to, and at that time, Kaumeke was just about to open preschool. So we didn't have a preschool yet. And I was encouraging the um, staff at that time. I'm like, come on, Sasa, come on, Sasa, Bahina's going to be of age. Uh, I, is our preschool going to be up and running? Because I really wanted my daughter to have the same experiences I had at Kula Kai Puni. Right, so, right. I wanted her to be in that setting. And so thank you to my, you know, office staff. They got it done. And, and my daughter went to um, our, our preschool, Kaikohola. And I loved it. And she loved it. And I, and I loved being a Kula Kayapuni mother. <laughs> I was <laughs> proud. I went, to, I went to the Christmas shows, you know, we were at the Makahiki ceremonies. You know, I was a Kumu, so I'm already there. But as a mother, I was so proud. <laughs> And, and then um, my son came and he did his first year at, um, at our preschool at Kaikohola. And he was proud and you know, they, they were happy there and they liked it there. And then we had the, uh, the pandemic and, and during the pandemic, I, I don't know, a, a lot of things happened to everybody during the pandemic, right. you know? Mm -hmm. It was a combination of being forced to be at home with all three of my, and I, now I have three, all three of my keiki, all at the same time, you know, being in the world of Americas, I don't know why we don't uh, invest in our keiki and we don't, we, we, they, America does not invest in their keiki and they do not invest in their families and in their ohana. And so with all of my keiki at six weeks old, I had to go back to the workforce and I had to leave them with a babysitter. And so they were being raised by someone else when I went back to work. And, and with my daughter, it was the hardest, you know, to have to rewire yourself from motherhood to Kumu to motherhood to Kumu. And, you know, they tell you about the hats. I hate that analogy about the hats. What hat it's, are you it's, wearing? It's against your instincts. Of, it's against your instincts. It's, it's like an animal to leave your baby. Like when I had to leave my, I had to leave my KK too. And it's like everything inside of you is like, yeah. you're not supposed to be away from your young you know, mm -hmm. like, like animal kind instincts, like you, it's so hard. It's so hard. It's so hard. And, and then the pandemic hit and I was at home at my keiki and I had to like rework my kumus schedule. You know, it was go get them kumus because when we had to shift from immediately in, we had spring break, we had to go online, you know, spring break, we were stay at home order. Mary Monica canceled. My daughter's first mm -hmm. hula performance got canceled. <laughs> so you know all of those things it was going to be the first time we were going to be on stage together we were going to do the opening of the Mary Monarch I was going to hold pa she was in our keiki class and she was going to dance and you know I dreamt about it since the day she was born and then uh -huh. and then it got canceled wow. <laughs> and um uh I, I I rearranged my schedule because I had to teach but also help my daughter and my son on their zoom and and it was hard and I my kumus and I know we tried so so much we tried to make it as realistic as possible but it was it, it was so strange uh, you know instantaneously I was in the homes of all my students and um when I sat down with Vahine for her class I was in the homes of our classmates and I watched my daughter 
um, tune out on the Zoom. You know, just like I watched my students zoom up, mm -hmm. tune out mm -hmm. on the Zoom. In the classroom, you know, Kumu is sage on the stage, you know, all eyes on me, you know, and, and we're having healthy conversations and, and, and they listen and they're there and they're with you. And then when you see them on Zoom, they're in their zone, you know, they're not in your zone and they become somebody different. And then you lose that connect. And uh, I saw it happen with my daughter too. You lose that connect between Kumu and Haumana, between classmates. And, and all of that kind of rattled me. You know, sometimes I think it was the pandemic, but sometimes maybe it was just timing. You know, like just like I was saying at Grandma Nancy's funeral, that it's when you can recognize the time for the bridge from one time, one space, one environment, you know, to the other then you know that's when you can really see things in the world you know that's when you're like you're mako cow for new things when you can realize opportunities of of one time and space into the next mm -hmm. and so that may have been really what it was and maybe it just happened at the time of the pandemic um and, and maybe it was the pandemic that started me to become I don't want to say the word disconnected, but almost disconnected to institutionalized education. Right. When, when, we, when we had to then go back the following year and uh, it was terrible for Kumus. You know, the DOE was trying to convince itself and its families that they knew what they were doing, but they did not know what they were doing. And they were pounding all this pressure onto the Kumus. You know, they wanted us to learn entire new systems in like two weeks. And I was like, no. And my mother, who was teaching um, elementary and middle school, was going to be forced to do two learning platforms. Mm -hmm. I said, no. You know, when, when, when I read these um, Texas online, whatever programs they wanted us to use, because they bought, I don't know, however millions in cost, but then buy one entire new platform and then force it on the Kumus. I was like, no, you know what I mean? I did not spend 10 years of, you know, devoted time away from my Ohana to create these things for now you to tell me what to do. I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it was a lot of that too. I, I was starting to realize that institutionalized education was weighing me down. And I, and I was trying so hard to, to, to fight the fight within institutional, institutionalized education because I, I, I realized that there's a whole lot of convolutedness in it. You know, when my husband was working, he has to go to work to, in Kona. So he leaves at nighttime and gets home in the winter at nighttime. And he gets to see our keiki for like two hours of the day. Mm -hmm. And I really seen that when we were at home because we were at stay at home order, but construction, they went on you know, they, mm -hmm. they're essential mm -hmm. workers. So I was at home on 24 seven, you know, we were not allowed to leave home only for shopping. Remember that was at that time. Mm -hmm. He's gone all day. I realized how much he doesn't see us. And I realized how much being in the workforce that we have this disconnect with our keiki. And so when I was home with them all the time, I, I, I think I was frightened to leave them maybe was the last push in me leaving Kaumeke. I was scared to leave them. I, maybe I had gotten ma'a to being with them. And I didn't want once again to have that feeling of when they're six weeks old and I have to leave them again. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was like, no. And, and so <laughs> you know, bless my husband who, who, who lets me make all these crazy decisions. Um, I told him that I'm going to stay home with our keiki and I'm going to homeschool them. And we were having lunch at Peve that day. I was in my classroom, like freaking out again about not knowing what I'm going to do with this first education by the DOE, not knowing how I'm going to feel comfortable again in my new space, like six feet apart. I was like arguing with the schools about masks and mandating masks. And you have to tell the kids, I'm like, I'm not telling them anything. I'm not a, health worker. I mean, I don't want to make them nervous. This is supposed to be our comfort zones. And now I have to like experience telling them what, you know, all these restrictions. And I was getting frightened about that. 
And, and so my husband brought me lunch and he brought the kids that day. And he said, like, let's go and have lunch at Peve. And so I told him we were having pizza. And I said, I'm not going back. And he said, are you sure? I said, I'm very sure. And he said, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so when I made that decision, that, that's how we kind of made it. I said, I'm not going back. I said, we can do this. We are going to just figure out our finances. We're going to figure out what we got to change, but we're going to do this. And he said, okay. And so, um, you know, homeschooling was born. And it was so hard to leave Kaumeke. It was so hard to leave my students. It was so hard to leave um, the school that raised me, you know, I went to Pulakaiapuni and it was so hard to leave. I, I, I never imagined that that was going to be a decision I made in my life. Just like I never imagined that was going to be a kumu. Uh, I never imagined that I would leave Kaumeke. But I, I did it and it was so hard. It was so strange at first, the transition from workforce mother to stay at home mother it's still happening. It is still happening. And we are a year later, you know, I, I thought it would be instantaneous, but I think no, because when you have a normal routine, you know, it's ma'a, you get your kids ready, you drop them off at school, you, you, you know, you almost flip a switch. I'm a kumu. And then I pick up my cake and I have to like flip a switch. When, when I was going to be at home, I was hoping it was going to be instantaneous, but it wasn't you know, down to the, the simple things that, you know, I never get to do for seven years, you know, make all three meals for my kids. <laughs> I never experienced that. And so I, I had to get that in, into routine. You know, I had to think about when I first started teaching them, you know, everybody knows uh, kindergarten Kumu, he's Kumu Hauoli. And I, I call it my Kumu Hauoli voice. I thought, I said, okay, I'm going to have my Aloha and a Kiki, Peha Kako voice. Because my daughter was six and my son was four at the time. And I had a, a Kane Ula, wasn't even one yet. And so I, I never taught um, early childhood, uh, middle school, high school English. You know, I'm dealing with attitudes, I'm not dealing with kolohenes. <laughs> And when I have my way Kiki, harder and load the babies. <laughs> way harder. You know, I, I just let them come home, run amok because you know you're in Kula all day. Just come home, play. Mommy's gonna fold the clothes. Mommy's gonna do the dishes. I'm gonna do all the things because you was a good cakey at Kula. We missed you all day. We don't want to make you sad. We just want you to have a good time <laughs> when you come home, right? But then when you have them all day, everything is your kuleana. And so <laughs> I, I am. I had to learn all over again, and I'm still learning really how to be a mother of three. And lucky me, if you ask all my sisters, I don't know if any of them are watching, lucky me, I have a great support system. I have a, a very supportive husband, and I have a very supportive mother-in-law. Uh, we call her Grammy, and Grammy helps me at home. And she, you know, because we're at home now, we realize all these things that we want our kids to experience. And one of the things we want them to experience is multi-generational homes. Right. Um, so Grammy now lives with us. So my mother-in-law lives with us. Oh, that's so awesome. That helps with the three meals a day, I bet. Yes. It helps. Oh, girl, it just it scares me. me thinking about if I really had to do, if I really was ever to do that and like just be a mother. Yeah, you know, when, when you're a kumu, I mean, when you're in the workforce, it's like, oh, I wish I was a stay-at-home mother. I could do these things. Or stay-at-home mothers, they're, they're so lucky. But who? Stay-at-home mother. It's, I got to say, I'm getting more ma to it. But in the beginning, I, was, I would confidently say working was easier. I think it's way easier. Because <laughs> you just do what easier. you got to do. Yeah, like yeah. there's no, I think it's way harder to just be at home. Mm -hmm. yeah, it is way harder to be at home and, and so I tried all kinds of different things you know my daughter sleeps in late my son is up by six you know and so I had to try you know if I'm institutionalized education to stay at home mom let me close this window <laughs> you know what one of the many things my father likes is large dogs and so these are one of his dogs we hear serenading <laughs> all our lives my father hasn't been involved with different types of dogs so oh just I part of the life on the homestead yeah that's just the yeah, homestead, it's the homestead. 
Some people have cookies. You know, we have large dogs. So. <laughs> well, I remember trying different things with my keiki. And, you know, being a kumu in the classroom, we already don't have any type of resources. And so now mm-hmm. I'm a stay-at-home mother. And what I didn't know where to start. I didn't even know how to start. I was like, I'm going to do it. And then like nothing. I had was like crickets. I didn't have anything. And so I didn't even know where to start. <laughs> How do I create a routine for my own keiki that I've never had all my, you know, seven years, somebody else has created their routine and I bring them home. And I I realized that school, really, a lot of the things that we do in school is meant to replicate real life. Mm -hmm. So then after, you know, a bunch of trial and error of things not working with my keiki at home, I realized that, you know, in, in in the classroom, I'm trying to teach them to get along well with each other. You know, I'm trying to put them in groups so that they can work together. Right. And when I went to my my son's uh, first day of school at uh, preschool, they learn um, how to get one toy, play with it the right way and put it back before getting another toy. Right. They learn how to stand in the line and they learn how to wait their turn. And then I realized, you know, they learn how to sit on a table and then, you know, put their dishes back on the sink. And I was like, these are all things that they can do at home. You know what I mean? I, I, did, I, I came from seven hours of teaching to thinking that that's what home was supposed to look like. Mm. But then I realized that, you know, regular kuleana at home is learning. You know, my mm-hmm. seven-year-old and five-year-old now, now after a year, you know, they can put away their own clothes. You know, they pull it out of the pile, they fold it, they put it away. You know, the seven-year-old, the girl is much more neat than the boy, but we can still do it. You know, we, we have, you know, different kind of morning routine. When you're in the classroom, you know, you might have name tag, you might have Richard name, those types of routines. But here at home in the morning, we have routines like, you know, put away the toys from last night, vacuum. My son, my five-year-old has to vacuum the two carpets. My daughter and I sweep and she sweeps the pile. So we have that kind of routine now, you know, Malama, the Hale routine. And then we have Kula routines. And then we have, okay, after we pile Malama, the Hale routines, and we pile do our Kula routines. Now we can think of our Ohana activity. Now that Ohana activity is going to be at home. We have a Mala. So we have plenty of things we can do with Ohana activity in the Mala. Uh, or we can have a beach day and we Iho Ikai. And you know, when, when you're homeschooling, you go to Kai when no more crowd, you know? And so we can, you yeah, know. You can go when it's like empty and really go explore and holo holo everywhere. I don't, I don't like to go on the weekends anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we get to go and we have these spaces, you know, sometimes to ourselves. My son, all of a sudden, it makes me, uh, you know how people be soccer moms? My son made me a skater mom, and so he loves to skate, and so we go to the skate park. Then we go and we go to the skate park, and then we go down to Lehia and swim on the black sand, and then when we get real adventurous, we'll walk in the back, we'll get our tubbies. And so, you know, that's what Kula looks like now at home. And, and you know, being a Kumu, I still had to, you know, I still have my, I got to report that to a principal so I created curriculum for my keiki you know actual books and and then and then being um of my father's nature I I had to do things like cut out the middleman like I created a kilo book an observation book for my kids and I went to office max to print it and they're going to charge me 60 dollars to print it and I said well this is retarded so I bought my own (laughs) book binding machine I bought me a larger printer and now I just print it and bind it myself wow. you know within their within their lifetime I'll have paid myself back <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I created so I created my own curriculum I did whether we do weather observations in the morning we do morning protocols just like Kula Kayapuni we we wake up in the morning after uh Kuleana Hale I call it Kuleana mm-hmm. around the house then we go outside and I, I, we do chanting, we, we do a sun chant, we do lono chants during lono season to get ready for, you know, the ceremonies. Mm. And then we do a weather observation and then the kumu in me, I made an actual <laughs> book that they write it in. Uh, we do a calendar with my son uh, and we, I do it all, it's in Olal Hawaii. Um, and then we do also do a fruiting trees observation because one of the questions my daughter asked me was she wanted to know about time and how to 
what is time? And oh, boo, I, I call it the rabbit hole. I dove into the rabbit hole because I didn't want to teach her just calendar. I didn't want to teach her the watch. I wanted to use that opportunity for her to understand uh, and become uh, you know, a practitioner of the places that we live. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted her to see time through our seasons. Right. And, you know, so through the weather, you know, I wanted them to uh, on, on to lay a foundation that doing Lono, it's going to be cold, it's going to be stormy, it's going to rain a lot. We live in Ola'a, it rains a lot. Uh, and then in Kauvela, we'll have our drier time. You know, we can go to the beach sooner and stay later because the sun's out longer. You know, the Kai is more Malie, you know, because, you know, you can't go King's Landing Kai at winter. So yeah. No, no. <laughs> so, I wanted them to be, that's how I wanted her to see time through seasons. Mm -hmm. I wanted her to see time, um, daily time. We track the movement of the sun. And so our morning chant has to do with the daytime movement of the sun. And so when they do their observations, yeah. uh, they put the date, but I also ask them what time of day is it? And so they'll put morning in Ola Hawaii, Aula, Kakahiaka, Avakia. So morning, um, noon, evening, afternoon, evening, so that they're starting to tell time by where the sun is. Mm. And, oh, and, and then exciting. I wanted them to also see, I, I figured we have fruiting trees in Ola'a, you know, we have tangerine, we have avocados, they grow wild on, you know, up here on um, Ola'a, you know, right on the road on Steinbach. And then, you know, we're lychee when we drive into Panaewa and into Kilkaha, mountain apples. So, I created another kilo book for them to observe fruiting trees so that they'll know when the lychee is flowering, when it's fruiting. So, you know, right now everything is fruiting so that I hope they start to know that, oh, when we go to the beach, when the days are longer, when it's really hot, that's also when we have the lychee. Right. So that's summer, you know, not just May, June, July, not just April, May, you know, that's not summer, but also when these things are happening within our spaces, that summer mm -hmm. for that summer. So that that's where we're at with Kula, and that's how I'm taking Honey. it. You know my keiki. Oh yes. Yeah, that's what I was gonna ask. Like, how is how is your keiki love? They must just be loving it. You know, they love Kula at home, and they but they still give hard time for the writing. <laughs> that that never goes away. You know, when we're talking about it, when we're driving, I'm like, oh, my cheese. They're like, oh, my cheese. I'm like, oh, look, avocado. They're like, yeah, avocado. So they love that. They, they love the discussions. But when we sit down to do the writing, it's like any old writing. My son is left-handed, so it's even harder for him. It's like, I don't want a cacao, mommy. I just want to put the sticker, and I just want to talk about it. So those things don't disappear. They don't naturally just sit down to love to write. My daughter is starting to write sentences when we're reading two times a day. You know, that, that is still a, a good bargain and a, mm -hmm. and a discussion that's borderline argument with the seven-year-old if she's going to read her second book today that doesn't go away <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course but they of love course. it when I when I ask them about how do you like Kula at home because I'm very uh sensitive if I'm not doing the right job and they're not comfortable then I'm more than happy to put them in the space that they need to belong and if that if they want to go back to Kaumeke then that's where they're going to go you know I don't want to be I don't want to make a decision that I want, but that they're not happy in. So mm. I, I check in with them all the time. And I ask my daughter, oh, how do you like cool at home? And oh, she loves it because she loves being with her family all day. You know, mm. her and her brother are like, are like really close now, you know, close. Like I play with you for 50% of the day and then we fight for 50% of the day. But <laughs> the opportunities that I have to talk them through it are like priceless. You know, mm. like I'm at home now, so I'm learning to be more patient with them and I'm talking them through when they when they argue about something, I'm, I, 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 I'm afforded the time to take the time to walk them through it instead of, you know, when you're working, you're rushing, you're like, ah, ah you go over there, you go over there and then you're done. But now I can like talk them through it. You know what and happened? You probably just Kui. being with them, like you see all the deeper issues of what really is irritating her. Is he's doing the same thing, like that? Yes. You know, like it's this deeper stuff that manifests. But just when you're yeah. not with your cakey all day, you don't even know. Yeah, it's totally. Just, you you don't even get to see it because you know, being a kumu, you work in the classroom and then you work at home, right. so I don't get to see it. 
Well, I don't not that's not true. I put blinders on because I, I have something else I have to get done. So mm. that's what happened. Mm. Yeah. And so yeah, I get to see all these uh nuances that are just uh you know lovely to see. It's it's really important. I want my I tell my daughter and my son, I'm like, your brother is your first best friend, Dita. Like, yeah. come on, you guys want to support each other all the way through. You know, if your tita is upset and she leaves, bro, you leave too. You know, if you're in a circle and, you know, boys at the beach, they're, they're not being nice to your tita. If she leaves, you leave too, bro. You don't hang with the boys. <laughs> you follow your tita. <laughs> right? Oh, that's super awesome. Like, how, what changes do you see in your keiki? Like, what kind of changes, even for your ohana dynamics, must be different? It is. It's very, it's very different. Uh, I, they get along. We just had our family uh, trip this weekend and we just came home and uh, we reflected on it, me and my husband and my mother-in-law. And I said, you know, I have to say overall, our Kiki behaved really well this weekend. And we all agreed. <laughs> like they behaved really well. You know, they got along with their cousins, you know, they may, you know, it's inevitable. There may have been somebody has my tube, somebody took my tube at the pool, but you know, they understand, we talked through it. Me and my kids were like, it's okay, Tita, go get the other tube or just wait your turn. And so I, I think we've had a lot of practice with talking through things. Mm -hmm. So it was nice to see it, you know, see what it looked like this weekend, you know, around around other people. You know, we stay in the mountains a lot and we stay with Jisa, <laughs> go to the mountain, go to, in, back into the Aina. And so, oh, and that's the other thing. I've naturally been seeing in my daughter a sense of community because not my son, he's too young yet. He just likes to go into the Aina because maybe get the skate park, maybe get the boys, the Aina boys. My daughter is really starting to see a sense of community. So I think about five years ago, daddy went back into King's Landing. When, I, when we were 17, about 17, 18, we left King's Landing and Maha, the association. You know, like, like all good communities, families start to start to argue and disagree. And then at that point, my mother had had enough of the disagreeing and she wanted to leave. And so we left and we came to Ola'a when I was about 17. Uh, Mom bought Aina, we built a hale, you know, a kauhale. A lot of us, the siblings had moved back home. And about five years ago, my father went back into King's Landing and he didn't tell anybody. Of course, he's not gonna tell anybody. He just went, he went on his own. He went back to the community meetings and asked for a new spot, got the spot. I, I feel like a year later, I caught wind of it. I was like, and I was here on the compound with him and I didn't even know he went back into the <laughs> And so- uh, so I just went a ninja I, right, right out of there. Ninja, ninja. Yeah. <laughs> went back down into the homestead. And we didn't know. And so I started, then I, I went, I caught wind of it. And I said, I'll let go too, Papa. I was her pilot number two. That's, so that's a good time frame. He's five now. He, I remember I was her pilot with him and I went riding with dad in the flatbed, which wasn't a good idea. I should have drove myself with no shocks in his flatbed. Um, I don't know, seven months hapai with my father's style. Uh -uh, I must have been smelling exhaust all the way in. Super bumpy. But I went to the meetings with him. You know, I started to go back into the meetings with him. And then uh, he got his new aina. We, we just finished. Uh, he has the hale. He's building his outhouse. Uh, my brother, I think, is moving back in there with him. So it's going to be wow. cute. It's going to be dad and brother time. Um, and then so we are back in the community and we're back in the nonprofit. And so, you know, I blink my eye and it's been about, mm, about uh, almost a year now. And my sibling, my twin sister, Vina and I, and my younger sister, Laka, we are now hands in, in um, our nonprofit. I mean, not nonprofit, but the board, the community board. So Maha Malama Kaina Hana Kaina is the board, the community association that my father created. Um, I think we was born. I may have been born. I think I was born 1984-ish, maybe a little sooner. When dad moved into King's Landing, you know, um, Hawaiian home, uh, DHHL, you know, interestingly enough, it was Uncle Luca Kanaka Ole who served. Um, this is Auntie Nalani and Auntie Pua's, I mean, sorry, Auntie Nalani, Auntie Pua's husband served 
I'm Uncle Ed, yeah, thank you. Uncle Ed served my mom and dad our eviction papers um, to, we had to vacate, right? Because we were squatters. And so it, it was disheartening for him, I'm sure. And, and at that time, then my father realized, okay, we have to create a hui because you know, government agencies, they don't like talk to a person. They want an agency to talk to an agency, a group to talk to a group. So they formed Malama Ka'ina, Hana Ka'ina. Um, and so um, it was a nonprofit. They got a 501c3. They have bylaws. They have board members. You know, we have a contract between Maha and DHHL to be there. And then, uh, so now we're back. And so now me and my Savina are hands on in that. And we are helping um, organize paperwork. I am all of a sudden running meetings. You know, I actually really enjoy it. I enjoy running the meetings. You know, you have to imagine I'm, you know, 15 years later, I'm like, hi, Auntie Rose, Pacheco, who was my babysitter. Hi, Auntie. Hi, childhood friends that I haven't seen since like seventh grade because, you know, all of us moved out and now blink your eye, we're back in. And wow. it's so nice to see my childhood biking friends and, you know, I, I it's it, it, almost the like bike a gang is back together. The bike gang is back together. It's like All so right. cool. I took my kids' bike into the Aina and I videoed <laughs> them riding bikes down these hills. And that's what we used to do. We used to bomb hills. And then my um, childhood friend saw it and she was like, oh my God, I'm in sixth grade again. I said, like, I know me too. <laughs> <laughs> Watching our Kiki ride bikes down the hill. It's so cool. <laughs> and, you know, uh, I love, I love being there. You know, my aunties tell me like, oh, I give you credit. You're in there with the, you know, the, mm. the bush people in the bumpy road dealing with your community. I'm saying, yes, I am. Because I tell you what, I, I don't think anybody else could do it. You know, you have to be of the bumpy road bush mentality to deal with <laughs> bumpy road bush people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's, you're made for it, girl. You're made for it. <laughs> So it, it's it's great. And my daughter, we go to the meetings together. She hangs out with the Aina kids, you know, she has cousins in there. And so it's so nice to see them roaming the streets and walking to Uncle Kuai's house across the street. And mama going to Uncle Kuai's and like, okay, come back while we're running the meeting. And so it's so much fun, you know, and then we go and we stay in the Aina with Papa at his house. And like, I love it. The simple things of hearing the ocean again when you're sleeping, mm. you know. Hearing, hearing the wind push the leaves on the trees again. It's like, it's it's beautiful to see. And and then my keiki, you know, are running around outside with the headlamps at night. It's like, uh, what, it's this amazing feeling to uh, be able to give them these experiences. You know, all these things I wanted. I wanted to pull out the best of my life and, and give it to my keiki. And so being back home in the Aina is one of those best experiences that I get to give them. And so... She, you know, we deal with people knocking down our gate, right? And so we were there fixing our gate one day. And Tita and my daughter, Vahine, was like, Mommy, you help the community. That's my. And I'm like, Yeah, my seven year old <laughs> daughter is sitting here watching the uncles weld our gate. You go, Tita. You know, I have all three of my kids and I can't really help, but I want them to be there so that we're there and we're there as a community and we're watching the uncles. And these are the uncles that were there when I was young, you know? They're like welding. They're like my dad's age and they're the ones welding the gate. We're like getting pieces and they got like my dad's on his yeah. flatbed with the generator, with the machine. And we're like welding the gate, putting it back mm -hmm. together again. Like they are amazing. You know, you know, people bang our gates. That's what do you do? You put up another one, you know, the KP. I tell them, come on, let's put up signs at the skate park. They're like, Pakumu. they break it. They, they tear it down. I'm like, Okay, my Kai, so you put another one, but they're just gonna tear it down. That's my Kai, you make a lot of cardboard so that's easy. You just put them up and you put them up and you put them up <laughs> because what you're going to do is stop. Uh, so, being back on the board, my daughter is seeing the importance of uh, community. And, and, I, and while I was at work at Kaumeke, I didn't have the brain space for anything else. I, I, I couldn't even imagine taking on the Kuleana of um, King's Landing and Maha while being at Kaumike. I couldn't imagine being a homeschooling mother and doing all those things at the same time. And so, you know, it's, it's great, it's my kai.
<laughs> well, I know like how your mother is brave. You're brave too, you know, because it's like that sacrifice that your mother and do to Hanau in the Aina, <laughs> which is the nurse and stuff. It's not that different from what you're doing to bring your keiki, to do that, to make that that lele away from this this society that we're like subjected to, you know, and to just jump away. You're brave too, sis. You really are. Uh -huh. it's, it's a big <laughs> thing and it like is your children will the benefits because even now like the downfall that you and have of like the teasing and the stigmas and at that time well all the other kids is probably so jealous yeah <laughs> no, 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 that I, there's another I've, error. I've taught some of their cakeies it's so interesting that when I see them drop off their makuas and they're dropping off their kids to Kaumeke and I'm like you know, I'm going to have a moment as I sit here. Maybe you're not going to have a moment, but I remember when you teased me for being in Hawaiian immersion. So I'm going to take my moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you yeah. know, no hard feeling. It, it was it was the pressure that was put on us. You know, you think about right. my father, guys, who don't, Olelo Hawaii, that entire generation. It, it baffles me. I It took me a long time. Like, I didn't understand how grandma and grandpa Iowana were fluent in Hawaiian. But my puku papa and my father, those two generations, zero crickets. Mm -hmm. They would say things like, yeah, when we walked into the room, Grandma Edith would just stop talking. You know, they would, because they, uh, you know, they didn't believe that there was a future in it. You know, right. they were conditioned to think that it was, you know, the dark days, the old days, you know, all those things mm -hmm. that they made us believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the same and, stigma. And, Right, that now you're gonna be backwards and you're cool, Aina, and you're not gonna be successful. Yeah, and it, it's sad because it's two generations of you know, it's like crickets no Ola no, Hawaii, um, no, no chanting, no discussions of uh, of chants, no discussions of myths, no discussions of stories, no discussion of kingdomhood, of, of our monarchy, nothing for two mm -hmm. generations, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we really are, there we go again, we really are that bridge, you know, my, my era where that bridge between of the Hawaiian Renaissance, you know, we grew up in it. And I, and I, I think we now we are the result of it. Mm -hmm. And we, we are in a time where, where those things are normalized. And it, it's so nice to see Olel Hawaii is normalized. You know, I love to hear Olel Hawaii at the store, you know, when I speak to my keiki, so many people, Nowadays are like I'm at Walmart and I'm telling my kiki put the stuff on the belt and put to a mommy and then the cash register guy is like oh my god you speak Hawaiian to your kids that's so beautiful I'm like I have to take a moment because there was a time when people said other things about all that right. mm -hmm. so, and you know it was it was a moment it was a nice thing to feel and it's nice to see things starting to get more normalized you know mm -hmm. is normalized you know you know yeah. uh, I really, you know, one thing that's not normalized yet, and me and you are going to do it, girl, I really want to, and I am, I am going to write, rewrite um, social studies curriculum and institutionalized education. We're going to do it. Yeah, we're going to do it. It's, we're doing We're going to do it. Like us too. We're going to do it. Yeah, we're going to do it. It has to be done. Because, you know, there, there's so, and you know, there's so much that I don't know, because when I went to Pula, that they fed me this, you know. Right. Well, I never learned of, anything that I'm teaching. I teach history of the Hawaiian Kingdom, yeah. Pacific Island studies, and modern Hawaiian history. And I never learned any of this until I went to college. None of this. Olé, I learned about and plantations and the big five. That's what I would learn when I was in school. And then, and then our keiki, you know, leave high school and they don't have a foundation they don't know who they are they don't know where they come from they they don't leave mm -hmm. with an instilled sense of patriotic pride you know mm -hmm. a positive mm -hmm. sense of identity their identity mm -hmm. yeah. is, is missing they're all confused they go into kula nui into university and and you know they think they have to go get a business major <laughs> so that they can be a <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> hey, we're gonna come back. It's all good. I, you know, business major is a valuable thing still yet, but you know. Yeah, it is. It is, and I, I you know, I'm thankful. I don't know how I went choose that path. You know, thank the Kupuna and their their uh powers at B to uh, you know, wield you. Because sometimes the decisions you make, you really don't know why, what, if, and then, you know, 20 years later, lo and behold, thank you, I took that path. <laughs> oh, so I know not- something we um, always like to ask is um, on our show to kind of wrap it up, you know, as you go to your mo'olelo, mahalo nui for sharing. It's really awesome to... Um, get to know you and I think that's our goal yeah Kumu is to bring the people of Lahui out and just to understand kind of you know the mo'olelos that the kanaka story and what it is what it is really like the the real the real stories you know not just the snapshots of your successes but the whole mo'olelo and so Mm -hmm. mahalo nui but something we always like to ask is um you know as you go forward in your journey, what would you like your legacy to be? Ooh, it's that's a that's a, that's a big question. It's just no pressure. I was gonna say that one's <laughs> <just an email. laughs> Sorry. No, you know we just we just started um, doing this whole uh, transition, uh, leaving Kaumeke. At the same time, we, me and my twin sister, because of you know, circumstances that have happened, we opened up a foundation for my father and we call it, it's really long, Kelly William Iwane Legacy Foundation. Wow. And the mission of our um, nonprofit is to ensure the prosperity of my father's legacies. And they are the homestead of King's Landing. So Maha, because him and mom started that uh, community association. So that's why I sit, I am back in there and involved in the board. Um, to ensure the prosperity of Makahiki in Keokaha, because mm-hmm. in 1984, my father bought Makahiki against the wishes of Malia Pukuokalani Church and against the wishes of my grandma Iris friends who are still alive. My, they told him no, and my father bought it anyway. And we are actually going to celebrate 38 years of Lono coming into Keokaha this year. Wow. And so, wow. 12 more years, and it's a living legacy. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, the, that legacy and then also um, to ensure the, to write new social studies or to empower Hawaiian positive, Hawaiian patriotic pride in our youth through my father's music. And so, so <laughs> that's the mission of my father's um, foundation to ensure his legacies, you know, because when you can blink your eye and you can realize that something that you saw, thought was secure can be threatened easily mm-hmm. and so being threatened of my father's legacies forced us to come together as a ohana to to ensure that they survive mm-hmm. and so it's that's a really hard question for me to answer because i yeah. am only 37 years old and right. i i it's haven't too, you know it's too only early now, yet too early only now looking at making sure my father's legacies survive and and i ensure that they are here for me and for my keiki you know i ah goodness it's a good the shadow start. Of my yeah. i haven't i haven't even fathomed them yet you know you know i'm, I'm sure i'll have something to do with ohana and building relationships with your keiki mm-hmm. I, i'm sure i have something to do with community and camaraderie and bringing um our com- communities back together again and mm-hmm. i'm sure i have something to do with um, land management and making sure that Kupa of the Aina are the one making land management decisions, you know, uh, about where we come from and, and about my oneha now and the communities that raised me. I want to make sure that my keiki understand that you are the voice of this place, not somebody else. So, mm-hmm. you know, that might be the ideas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all great and you definitely are on your way to mahalo nui for everything yes thank you for coming so great to have you thank yeah you. mahalo thank you auntie for asking <laughs> <laughs> thoroughly enjoyed it mahalo mahalo nui same thing else you want to add 
before we sign off for tonight? You know, um, that uh, answer, wait, you know, the answer that you just gave about legacy, you know, being as old or young as I am, I don't know even how to put it, but um, it sounds so Hawaiian. It sounds very, 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 um, it has a mana'o Hawaii because usually um, legacies are, are, um, are, given that way, you know, it's not necessarily for you, but it's for something that has, you know, has been brought from like your dad, you know, all these things that your dad has done, you know, I mean, against Kupuna or against, and I shouldn't, we shouldn't even say against anybody. It's just that we had to stand there as warriors many or in many occasions to you know, have people just know that what we were doing was not doing, we weren't doing it with malice. We were really, really doing it with all the aloha that um, we were given through experiences and and ike from kupuna that went hala. You know, when you when you talk about stuff like kaho'olabe, waihole waikani, or um, the four waters, you know, Navaiha, you know, all the guys that from like the 60s, 70s that was very involved, old, young, you know, young that became older, you know, that still are alive, that carry the torches for the ones at Hala, you know, we just lost, you know, how uh, nani ke, you know, and, you know, I mean, I, you know, I just think to myself when I saw that all the people during that time, your dad, Auntie Millie, you know, um, you know, I cannot even, you know, Pony Hipali, all of these people that have been, uh, you know, Emmett, Uncle Emmett, all of these people, Uncle, you know, all these people that, um, these people were together at that time, bringing all of, like, building that Wapo, you know, and for your own and, and bringing it to this first statement you made, and it is so, so powerful. And that is we need to get back these sacred places that that spaces, the spaces, it's not so much a place, but the space by which we occupy, by which the Aina has in place, you know, all of these things just come to play in this dialogue that I that I heard tonight. And I just want to say mahalo. And that, you know, even it, it, it came during a time for you too, it's your grandmother. So just mahalo, mahalo for sharing tonight. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, mahalo nui aina, mahalo for And everything. it'll be another saga. We're gonna invite you for the next saga. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> okay, mahalo nui for joining us out there tonight. Um, we'll be back again next week with guests from Molokai. Um, and so we'll be putting it out there. Mahalo for joining us. Ahui ho. Ahui ho.